I am now especially delighted to welcome as my guest the Minister for Women and Mental Health, the Conservative MP Maria Caulfield. Welcome, Maria. Now, Maria is the MP for Lewis. It's a lovely part of the world. I happened to be there recently. Um, but, but she also had a, had a real job before entering politics and becoming Minister for Women and Equality. She was a nurse for um, several decades and, um, um, and also a, a nurse uh, latterly in cancer care. And I was chatting with her before. And the reason that she got into politics was um, there was a very good hospital in her constituency that was going to be shut down, and she felt that was terrible, so she campaigned to keep it open successfully, so they, of course, co-opted her into politics. And here she is, Minister for Women Appointed October 22, and Mental Health, and by the way, it is Mental Health Week. So let's start off, um, Maria, tell us, what are the government's priorities when it comes to um, um, making progress on the inclusion agenda? Yeah, so the government absolutely uh, wants to be uh, seeing the workplace more inclusive, whether that's in terms of supporting women in the workplace, whether that's um, for different ethnic groups, whether it's different age groups, uh, because what we know from the evidence is that a workplace that is more uh, broadly reflects the population it serves tends to do better, whether that um, tends to do better in business and it's much more successful, whether it's an organization that, um, such as the NHS, for example, um, or other organizations. If you are reflecting the, the population you're serving, um, not only is that good for the employee, um, but it's good for the organization, but it's also good for the people you serve. If they're engaging with people that are the similar age, similar background, similar gender, who've gone through similar issues to them, it's a win-win for everyone. And so the government, what, what the government doesn't want to do is be uh, dictating in this space as to how you get there. But what we want to do is to work with organisations, businesses um, and groups um, to share best practice and to gently steer uh, towards a more inclusive uh, workplace because the benefits are really obvious and those organisations that do it well are successful in, in the business that they do. Uh, and that should be the motivation for everyone because the evidence is, is pretty clear to see. So we've heard this um, quite a lot today, that the evidence is pretty clear to see. Um, and yet uh, the progress isn't always as fast as we would want. And I know that um, we've spoken earlier about this, about having you know clearer KPIs to measure the progress. And what do you think from the government's perspective, that some of those KPIs should be, what does success look like? Yeah, so we do have some KPIs. So while I say we're not going to uh, force uh, any measures uh, on organizations or businesses, we do have KPIs. So we have got gender pay gap reporting, for example, which has seen an improvement uh, in the gender pay gap. So that when you do measure things, you do start to see some progress. We are looking at introducing voluntary ethnicity pay gap reporting mm -hmm. um, uh, because we want to, to get a feel of uh, what the differences are in, in different organizations and businesses. But that the more characteristics you measure, uh, the more complex it becomes. So, you know, for example, is it uh, around uh, a difference in, in ethnicity in terms of pay gap reporting? Or does gender have a factor in that? Or do other factors? So we are ro rolling out a voluntary scheme and asking employers to be part of that. We've got the Inclusive Britain report, uh, which the government has produced, which looks at a wide range of issues, not just the workplace. But one of the initiatives um, from that is the Inclusion at Work panel, mm -hmm. which is a group of academics, a group of business people that are looking at best practice. And uh, there will be um, opportunities there for businesses who are really keen. And when I, uh, uh, as a minister, talk to businesses across the country, you know, the ONS figures are out today that there's a, a million vacancies in the country. They want to recruit people and they knew, know to get the best talent and the best people. They have to have a very supportive workplace that will uh, encompass uh, employees' needs. And so they're really actually hungry to find out what will work in my organization to uh, benefit my employees. Um, and it's not just a case of recruiting, it's retaining as well. So a good example of that is uh, around the work we're doing about menopause in the workplace. Uh, and we're, as uh, uh, the government, uh, parliament, the NHS, have all signed up for the Wellbeing uh, for Women Menopause Workplace Pledge. Uh, and that's nothing draconian. It's nothing difficult. It's about um, having that open space so women can speak to their employer if they're having uh, symptoms, getting time off to go and see their GP for HRT, 
having a ventilated room, uh, you know, simple measures like that that make a big difference to women. But we know a significant number of um, experienced, qualified women leave the workplace because of the menopause. So that's just one example of how, as a government, we can share best practice with employers who are very keen uh, to, to, to find out how they can support their workers and then make a difference in the workplace and keep uh, employees uh, who want to stay in work but are, are struggling, uh, that the workplace is working for them. Yeah, I think those are all very um, important things you touch upon. We know from our work at CMI that 80% of our members definitely support um, voluntary ethnicity pay gap reporting. We, we do that pay gap reporting ourselves. Um, but yet, you know, there has been progress, as you say, in many areas. Um, women on boards is another great example. But um, yet still, do you think um, that employers truly do understand the business benefits and the talent benefits of inclusion? Because as you've said, um, we have, you know, skills gaps. Um, we need people from diverse characteristics, women, ethnic minorities, socioeconomically disadvantaged people to fill those incredible skill gaps. And we need them to get the country growing again. Um, so how, what do we need to do, it will be voluntary, you've said, to get more businesses to just grasp this? Yeah, and you are right. And the businesses um, that are doing this well have, have already done much of this work. Um, and it is, um, you know, others that, are the, I mean, it's a mixture. So some are very small uh, businesses and that don't have the capacity to really look at uh, the measures that, that would make a great deal of difference to their business. And that's where the government can step in and say, here's what you can do to, to grow your workforce, to make your workforce more, more diverse, to make your workplace more inclusive. Um, a great example of that is the STEM sector. So mm -hmm. in schools, we've got 30% more uh, girls taking STEM subjects at uh, GCSE and A level, which is fantastic. But we're not seeing that transfer into the workplace. So they're not taking up those uh, jobs uh, once, uh, and they're qualified, they're experienced, but they're not taking up uh, th those jobs in those sectors. So one of the schemes we've just launched um, uh, earlier this year, uh, because it's not just that they don't go into the, the, those professions, they don't stay in those professions, even if they uh, uh, start off in them, is the STEM Returners Project. So often women will leave the workplace either because they've got responsibilities with childcare or they're looking after elderly parents and they just leave the workplace. So the STEM Returners Project is there for all employers. Uh, so maybe those that haven't traditionally looked at how they can support women in the workplace, it's a project which will enable experienced, qualified women to come back into their uh, place of employment and the government is supporting them to do that. So hopefully they will see the, the benefits of signing up to schemes like that that will make, a, you know, filling those, those vacancy gaps with experienced uh, women in the workplace. And I think it's about changing the culture. We have got, as you said, got key indicators where we're measuring uh, our performance, but it is about changing that culture mm -hmm. and, and that takes time as well. It does take time, but I wanna, I'm gonna ask you about cultural change because it's a very hot topic at the moment. But let's back up. We're in the IET um, engineering and uh, Institute of Engineering and Technology, the largest engineering professional body. I sit on the board of the Engineering Council. Um, what you said about STEM returners, you know, I hear all the time, oh, as you said, 30% more women are studying engineering, but exactly as you said, they are leaving the engineering profession, which is why we still only have 12% of, for example, chartered engineers, something that's been stuck there for a decade. So tell people in this room, and hopefully the, all the engineers are listening, um, how can they access this STEM returner scheme? Because it is a critical enabler. Yeah. So what do I need to do as a business? I want to get a skilled person in my, yeah. in my employee. What do I need to do? So go onto the government website because the STEM returners project um, is uh, available there and you can sign up if you've got vacancies um, that women could go back into your workplace as an employer. Uh, we, we can help guide you through that. And we've got women who are... Um, keen to get back in, into the workplace and we support them through that uh, and we'll give them advice as well and as part of the inclusive britain work that we've been doing which looks at a wide range of issues uh, facing uh, uh, people across the country employment is one of those and we've got the inclusion at work panel which is a, a panel of experts producing best practice guidance uh, for employers so if they are not sure 
if what they are doing in the workplace is supporting people of different genders, of different ages, of different ethnicities, um, to, to, to look at the uh, Inclusion at Work panel because the best practice guidance is there. Um, and, you know, we're also doing work in, in terms of high growth uh, uh, businesses for women mm -hmm. because that's we've got so many women starting up their own businesses. I don't think we're short of women going into business, but we, what we are short of is women starting high growth businesses. And if you look at the, the data, and we've got Anne Bowden, who's chairing our high growth task force because uh, we absolutely need to encourage those women. It will add billions to our economy if we can get women leading their own high growth uh, businesses. But venture capital is one of the big uh, 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 kind of restrictions to that taking off at the moment. And it's that's all down to networks. Mm -hmm. So if you look at men in business, they've been in business for decades. They know the people who give out the money. They've got the contacts to who uh, know them, who will take a risk on their business. And at the moment, for every pound of venture capital that's given to a new business, 89 pence of that goes to businesses set up by men. Yeah. Only a penny goes to businesses set up by women. That's not because women businesses are any less valuable or any less successful, but because they don't know the networks to go in and be able to get those contacts to, to get that borrowing and investment into their business. So the work that Anne Bowden's doing in the High Growth Task Force will be reporting back to government um, uh, fairly shortly. And it's those sorts of measures that will make a difference. And I think having women... Um, not just starting their own business, but starting high growth businesses who will be employing other women who've had that struggle themselves. I think that will also change some of the cultural um, factors that we see in the workplace, which means that, that women uh, in particular uh, are often um, struggling to uh, succeed, you know, where, where men succeed so easily. Yes. Well, and one of the themes that's come up today quite a lot is what we need to do. And this was a question. Um, um, Michael Lane Fox asked at the beginning of the day, do we have the right people in the room? And when you look at cultural change, because you've referenced that a lot of this is about cultural change, and that's not easy. Um, but, you know, sometimes um, we have to say, do we have the right people in the room? And make sure we have the right people in the room that are capable of changing that culture. Uh, what is your view of that? Do we have the right senior leaders in the room to make the cultural changes we need to put inclusive behaviors at the top of not just the business, but also the government and society's agenda. What else do we need to do? Yeah, so I think we do. So with, with women like Anne Bowden, who started her own her bank um, and struggled to do so, even though she had spent her whole working life in, in the finance sector, and seeing the struggle that she had and her remarkable story of how she succeeded, you know, she knows the barriers that, that the women are facing in the high growth uh, industry. So having that experience in there, and I think that's why, I think Ronald Reagan said, the nine most frightening words are, uh, we're from the government and we're here to help. Uh, <laughs> the government isn't always the best people to have in the room. You know, we can measure things, we can provide funding, we can provide structure, we can provide legislation, but actually, unless it comes from within, um, often that, that difference is only um, superficial. And what we don't want to do is when we're doing, whether it's gender pay gap reporting or the number of um, girls going in, in, into studying STEM, we don't want it to look good on the surface and then underneath nothing's actually changed. And so it is about getting people, experienced people in the various sectors. So whether that's construction, whether that's STEM, whether that's non-traditional sectors, we need to have those in the room. And the government's trying to do that with the range of task force um, uh, and, and getting the sectors themselves to think, you know, we've got vacancies here. How can we fill them? Why aren't we filling them? Why is it that the women are going to work in other sectors? Is it because construction isn't attractive? Is it because the STEM sector isn't attractive to the workplace? Is it childcare? Is it uh, progression? Is it that um, the culture within that sector is misogynistic? Whatever it is. And I think that's that's when you get that change. Um, government can only do so much uh, and we, we, can, we can support. But if we mandate, if we legislate, that sometimes looks good on the surface but hasn't really changed anything underneath. Well, it's interesting. Um, you've mentioned a number of barriers that have come up and um, uh, to, to greater progress. Um, one, definitely childcare. I'd be interested to get your thoughts on what more could be done there. Another is, um, you know, if I refer to the behavioral aspect, CMI is all about better leadership and management. As we know, better leadership and management is a huge driver of productivity and inclusivity. We have it at the center of our 
uh, uh, professional standard. Do you think that people pay enough attention in some of these sectors where there are fewer women to the importance of management and leadership behaviors? Yeah, no, I think there, there is an issue there. And some sectors are, do operate in a silo. Um, and so they're not necessarily influenced by what other organizations are doing um, and maybe for too long have, have been uh, able to operate in that manner. But I think the workplace is changing. And I think the fact that we have so many vacancies now in this country and we have a, a, a skills shortage, that it's making every sector look how can they attract the best possible talent? And if they're not able to, why is that? So I think all organizations are looking at that. And I think employees are in a much more powerful position than they've ever been, a, been in before. They can pick and choose which sectors they work in. People don't just stay in a job for life now. Um, you know, even a, a, as a nurse, for example, you know, you, that, that was traditionally always a job for life. It doesn't have to be now. These are degree educated, uh, women, men, um, you know, uh, who can then go to, into another sector very, very easily. So I think because employees are now empowered and the inclusion at work panel are also there to support employees. So if you're working in an, organize, an organization and you don't feel it's inclusive or you haven't got those options that you would have in another sector, they will be able to provide you know, evidence and support to try and change the culture from within. But I think it's about empowering employees as well as trying to change that culture at the top because um, you know, employees will vote with their feet and they will go to those sectors now uh, where do provide uh, that kind of opportunity to thrive that will pay for your training and your development, that will uh, take a chance on you and promote you. Um, and you don't have to stay in an organization that won't do that. Well, and increasingly, as we've heard throughout today, people are voting with their feet, younger people especially. Um, so thank you for sharing your thoughts with us today. I'm sorry that time just flew by. Um, so please uh, join me in thanking Maria Caulfield, the Minister for Women and Mental Health. Thank you so much for joining us.